predominantly Protestant. And growing up, up most of my friends were all Protestants. Uh, and there wasn't a great deal of Republicanism about it during my youth, except through my father's background. And my father w would keep be pretty private about that, except on occasions where he would talk about um, his cousin being shot dead in New York Street, um, the involvement of my grandfather and so forth. Um, but on, on 1969, when the, the programs came about, when houses were being burnt out, when the beast specials were shooting up the street and so forth, I became involved in the movement then actively through a cousin of mine who was a guy called Charlie Hughes. Um, he was shot dead in 1971 uh, by the official, by the official IRA. By that time, by 1970, there, a split had arisen within the Irish Republican Army and a professional wing of the Irish Republican Army was formed. I became involved as a member of that organization. And through that, um, initially it was because uh, to, to form defenses against attacks by the B specials, the RUC, and the loyalist mobs, and born in the places like Bombay Street, the areas where I lived myself, uh, which was off the Grodden Road. Um, then the British Army came in. And the, the war actually started then with the British Army. The British Army raided houses in, in the lower falls where I lived uh, and lifted arms catches that the IRA had hidden, uh, which resulted in the lower falls curfew, which I was involved in. Um, there were people there from the 40s campaign, the 50s campaign, people like Billy McKee, uh, Pontius McCart, who were long-term Republicans and who's seen this as an opportunity uh, to bring about a united Ireland. And that's when, when I actually got totally involved in, in the Republican movement and the Republican struggle against the British. And so were you arrested that time? I was not arrested until uh, 1973. Uh, I'd been on the run from 1970. And the, the British troops raided my house looking for me, uh, arrested my father, interrogated my father, and uh, and then released him 48 hours later uh, with no shoes on to walk home with his bare feet. Um, so from 1970 until 1973, I lived in different houses every night. I moved from house to house. Um, the British were, were continually raiding to try and capture me. Um, they actually started to, it was they who nicknamed me the Dark, which then called the Dark. It was they who called me the Dark, the British troops. But from 70 to 73, uh, I was just constantly on, on the run. And, and how old were you at that time? Uh, I was 21. And then how did your capture come about? Uh, I was arrested on the Falls Road, along with Jerry Adams and Tom Cahill. Uh, by that stage, the British media, the, the, the press in, in England, had uh, headline, headline uh, news articles about me being the, the commander of the IRA or being operations officer of the IRA in Belfast. And we were, we were having a, meet, a meeting on the Falls Road, uh, myself, Jerry, and a few others, uh, when the British Army raided the house and arrested us all. I was then taken to, we were all taken to uh, Springfield Road RUC station where we were interrogated by uh, plainclothes British troops, British undercover operatives, and we were tortured. Uh, I was continually tortured for a period of up to eight hours. I was uh, beaten with, with small hammers. I was tied against the wall and continually punched and kicked. Uh, I was then tied to a chair and continually beaten. Um, they put a, a weapon, in, a, a gun, the 45, in my mouth and pulled the trigger. Obviously, it didn't didn't work. Um, they threatened to shoot me there and dump me on the Black Mountain and put a statement there saying the loyalists had killed me. And, and what were you being charged with at that time? Nothing. Nothing. I wasn't arrested with anything. Um, I was... When they were interrogating me, they were trying to get me to make a statement to say I was a member of the IRA, which I did not. Um, so after a period of uh, I think, uh, 14 or 15 hours, I was handcuffed, mangled, thrown into the back of a, uh, an armored car and driven to Long Tash, where I was interned um, for an indefinite period without any charge. I wasn't charged with anything. I was just thrown into Long Tash uh, internment camp. 
And then how long were you interned? I was there. I was there for about uh, eight months. Uh, then I, I, I escaped from Long Cash. I escaped in, in a, uh, a garbage garbage truck. Uh, what what happened was that I, I was put inside a large bag uh, with rubbish, sawdust, and all all the, the garbage of, of the camp. Um, the, 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 the guys who came to lift the rubbish, the, the, the lorry came every, every day. Uh, I was thrown into the back of the, the garbage truck. And after four or five hours going around the camp, the, the truck left, left Long Cash. And up towards Hillsborough, I was able to release myself from the bag, jump out of the lorry. Um, and then I got a lift actually to Newry, uh, where I had some money. Uh, coming out of the, coming out of the jail, where I hired a taxi and I was driven to Dundalk, where I was eventually free. Was, was there any chance of you ever being crushed within the garbage truck? No, no, it, it wasn't that type of. It was, a, it was an open lorry type truck. I mean, the, the, the danger, the biggest danger, was before the truck left the camp. Uh, British soldiers would, would push a large spiked object through the rubbish. Uh, and it actually happened that day, but uh, I had a bit of luck that day, and, and I, I did, at both times they missed, uh, and I wasn't hit. But at, at that period when that, this was happening, I knew exactly what was happening because we had done some intelligence work on it. We knew exactly the, the whole process. But I took a chance, uh, and it, it worked out okay. They, they did not spike me. Uh, but it, I must admit, at one period, I felt like jumping up and shouting that I was here and fear of being spiked by this, this large, it was like a large spear. And then how long were you free at this stage? How long did you stay free? Well, with, I got across the border, uh, got a new identity, uh, got my hair dyed, uh, and changed my whole appearance, and came back. I was back in Belfast within 10 days. Uh, 19, 1974, May 1974, I was arrested in Belfast again. I was arrested on the Malone Road, in a large house in the Malone Road, which is totally outside a working class area, which was a policy of, 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 of mine at the time, to, to move outside of, of working class areas because it was becoming so hard to, to, to move around. Uh, I established an identity as a, a traveling toy salesman and set up home outside of, of, of West Belfast altogether. But I, I would travel into West Belfast every day dressed in a suit with a briefcase and so forth. Um, I was often stopped, often stopped by British troops and, and RUC. But I, I always got by until the particular day when they raided the house and, and arrested me, along with uh, a load of weapons and um, munitions, detonators and so forth. And then what were you charged and sentenced to at that stage? Pardon? What were you charged with and sentenced to at that stage? I, I was I was charged with possession of uh, weapons and sentenced to 15 years. Um, they then took me out again and charged me with a skill from long cash and gave me another one and a half years. Um, I went I went into long cash and sometime in 1978 I became uh, OC of the prisoners in long cash. Um, at one period, the, the, there was a, a, a bit of a riot, and in my attempt, at, at, at being OC, I attempted to, to stop the riot. But in, in doing that, uh, I was accused of, of, of causing the riot, and I was taken out and sentenced to another five years. Um, that the, the morning I, I, I went to court, my, my position has been OC of long case. I would go out every morning and negotiate with the guard mayor of the prison on conditions and, and people would make requests and I would have to go and sit and talk with the, the governor uh, and request these things that prisoners were looking for. Uh, sometimes it was a mandolin, sometimes it was a guitar, sometimes it was a pair of boots or medical equipment or, or something like that. And I'd go and sit and it would be quite cordial and quite friendly. And I was called Mr. Q's or, or oh, come on, an officer. Uh, shortly afterwards I was taken to court sentenced another five years, found myself in the back of a truck and taken down to the hitch blocks of Long Cash. I was walked in, pulled the strip, uh, thrown 
going into your cell naked and with a blanket around me. But they, they, did they ask you to wear a prison uniform? They asked me to wear a prison uniform, yeah. And then you refused? I refused to wear a prison uniform, yeah, because I didn't see myself as a criminal. I was a political prisoner. And, and at that stage, how long was the blanket protest going on in the H flocks? The blanket protest had gone on almost two years. Uh, I had been in contact with the me, me being OC of the, of the prisoners of Long Cash. I was also OC of the prisoners in the H block. But uh, at no time could I visualize the conditions of the men in the H blocks until I got there. Um, but I, I, I put it on appeal against the five-year conviction because I, was, I, was, I actually had a prison officer who went and gave evidence to the fact that I was not involved in any sort of rat. I was involved in trying to piece of hat. But I think at that period they wanted me out of the his box and uh, they gave me the five years. Soon, soon afterwards, after 10 days or so, with the, uh, the prisoners there asking, asking me, to take over because it was totally disorganized. There was two blocks at that time. It was H5 and it was H3. And there was no C of H5 and no C of H3. And there was no communication at all. Because at that period, they were not taking visits. Uh, there was no papers. There was no radio. There was nothing, absolutely nothing at all. Everybody had long hair uh, and long beards. Uh, I, I felt the responsibility to, to try and change that. So I dropped the appeal against my five-year conviction and became OC of the two blocks, H5 and H3. Uh, I then started to organize because I knew uh, the, the prison authorities had our people, my people, totally under control. They were totally, the place was spotless clean. Uh, the, the screws, as we prison officers, as they're, they're called, uh, had, were totally in control of this. And the, the, the people, there was over 150 men here at the time, uh, were not going anywhere. So my point was, we need communication. We need to stamp up this protest. We need to do something. And actually, I initially suggested that, and this may be hard to believe, but it's actually true, uh, that we put on the prison uniform and we go into the system and we wreck the bloody place. Just, just totally wrecked the prison because at the way we were we were stuck in the cell 24 hours a day no fresh air no showers no anything but the people who were there for two years found this very very hard to take so it was decided that we, we couldn't we couldn't take that line so we then i ordered uh that people begin to take visits um, and to take a visit you had to put on the prison uniform that was okay as far as i was concerned it was a compromise we had to make for the, for the uh, point of, of making communication and to get more outside of what the conditions were really like. And from that, uh, we went right into the blanket protest and right into the hunger strikes. But maybe before we get to the hunger strike, maybe you can explain how you ended up on the dirty protest. Well, because we, were, we, we began to take visits, because we began to, to, to smuggle things in, uh, we began to bring pens in, it's a paper and uh, we began to smuggle things out by, uh, we, we called them barches, right? which is a, a communication uh, wrapped up in, in cellophoid. Uh, it was placed up, up the anus right? or sometimes up the nose. Uh, it would be passed over sometimes in the mouth and would be passed over uh, on a visit. Uh, the prison authorities realized what we were doing. Uh, because obviously they were reading sales and they were finding tobacco, they were finding pens, they were finding stuff. So they introduced uh, a mirror, the mirror search. And what, what happened on the visit was that they, they came, they took you out of the cell, brought you up to the end of the corridor, um, forced, forced you to squat over a mirror. Uh, uh, we, we refused to squat over the mirror, so we were physically forced over the mirror to, so they could look up the anus. Um, they would then badly mistreat us, mess us about going out on the visits and so forth, uh, coming back. So, and the, the, the shower thing, right? They, they were supposed to give a shower once a week. Uh, they wouldn't do that. Sometimes they would give, let someone go for a shower. Other times they wouldn't. Um, and so most of the time when people went for a shower, they were getting physically, verbally abused. 
So the order was given by me, no more showers. We stopped going to the showers. Uh, we refused to wash. So they began to bring buckets around, buckets of, of water, and threw them into the cell, often just throwing them on the floor and the water would spill. We were supposed to wash for this. So the order was given to smash the basins, to smash the, 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 the jugs, uh, which were plastic. So we, we smashed all, all those. So they stopped doing that. Um, it came to a point where the, we had to stop going out of the cells altogether because of the abuse, the, the physical and, and uh, verbal abuse we were getting every time we left the cell. And that's what developed into the dirt protest. We started to stay excrete in the cell. We wouldn't wash, we wouldn't go out. Uh, and the cell just became uh, infested with uh, r rubbish, uh, with urine, with uh, excreta. And the, the leftovers of the food that they were, they were, they were given. And how long did that last? That lasted almost three years. Uh, but there was a, a slow development because through, through, the, through the, the protests we were making, we, we eventually destroyed our beds, uh, smashed them up, broke the windows. Um, so we were left with a mattress. All we had was a blanket and a mattress on, on the uh, floor. And they would come in, most nights they would come in with, with hose pipes and just open the cell door and... and you get hosed down. Uh, other times they would come in with, with uh, very, very strong disinfectant and just throw a bucket of disinfectant around you to the point where uh, it brought tears to the eyes. It was very, very painful. Uh, after we, we, we smashed the windows, they came in and put uh, iron grills on the windows. So it was totally, we were totally sealed in. Uh, this carried on for al almost three years. Uh, and were there any heat in the cells? Hmm? Was there any heat? I mean, was the wind coming in through these uh, grating? Yeah, yeah, the snow. I mean, you, you would wake up in the morning with, with snow on you. When, uh, yeah, the, the windows were totally open until they put the grills on, even with the grills on. Uh, very often they, they turned the heat off at nights. In the cold winter nights, they turned the heat off. In the hot summer days, they turned the heat on. Um, they would put a large machine. Uh, it's, we, we used to pour the urine out the cell doors at nights. Um, and they would put this large uh, sucker machine in to, to, to lift and leave the machine all night. It was like a generator going all night. Uh, they'd let the lights on all night. Um, and as I say, in the, in the winter nights, they would turn the heat off. And this would bring us up to near 1980. How were you able to communicate and organize a hunger strike within the prison? We had uh, a line of communication through the Irish language. Um, at nights, on, at nights we would we'd be able to shut out the windows um, in Gaelic. Uh, what what was happening? Uh, we were able to send communications from a, a guy would go on a visit with the communication. If I wanted the communication to hits back, I was in hits back five. And I wanted the communication to hits back three. I would um, write, a, write a communication and give it to someone going out on a visit, and often. Other people from H5, H6, H7 would meet on the visits and would, the communication would be passed on that way. But by and large, it, it, it was done through um, shouting at nights, at the quiet nights. And Long Case was a very quiet place at night. And we were able to shout from one block to another block, pass communication from one wing to another wing and on to another block. Now that, that's how we done it. And how did you come to the decision about the hunger strike? Well, because we were, we were getting so much publicity uh, because of the conditions we were in. And remember this, for, for, for two years these men had been sitting and no one knew anything what was going on. They were being brutalized, they were being tortured, they were being totally mistreated. By 1980, uh, people were beginning to realize that there was something wrong. But the main breakthrough was when Cardinal O'Fee, the, the Catholic uh, the Archbishop, but the, uh, the Catholic Cardinal of, of Ireland visited the prison, but he was only allowed to visit the prison or visit people from South Armagh, or Armagh where he came from, Cardinal Fee came from, but by pure chance I was in a cell with a guy from Armagh and Cardinal Fee came in and I spoke to him uh, and he was really, really touched by what he seen. And 
he worked out the prison gate and made a, a public statement on television and called it like the streets of Calcutta. He hates blacks. Um, from then on, he, he, he began negotiations. Cardinal Lafayette began negotiations. And his contact with me was a priest called Father Alec Reed. Alec was a chaplain in the prison. And Alec kept in, in constant contact with me. He was, he was there almost every day. And he always told me uh, that the Cardinal was doing things. The Cardinal was making behind the scenes. We actually began nicknamed the priest, Father Alec Reed. He was a, a lovely gentleman. Uh, behind the scenes, that's what his nickname was. And Cardinal Fee went to see Maggie Thatcher. And I wasn't there at the meeting, but I was told that Maggie Thatcher was totally insulting to the Cardinal. Uh, but we had our hopes really, really built up here that we were getting a breakthrough. I was getting word back through Father Alec Reed that there's, there's things happening, there's things happening. Hold on, hold on, because. We had been threatening hunger strike for, for about a year now. We actually were going to call when we were asked to hold back. Then one day, uh, I got a visit from Danny Morrison, who told me on the visit that Maggie Thatcher had shut the door on the Cardinal, and there was nothing. And we had almost 400 men here who were sitting, waiting, who'd been sitting on a blanket for years. And all their hopes was built in, in, into this, into the Cardinal of Fee making some sort of progress. And here we had Maggie Thatcher just shut the door in his face. And I was told this on a visit. I got a visit from Danny Morrison, and Danny told me. He brought a cigar up for me that day, and I, I lit the cigar up. The only time he could smoke was on the visit. And I smoked a cigar, and he told me that the door was closed. The Cardinal got nothing. And I didn't know what to do. And he asked me, actually, what are you going to do now? And I said, there's no alternative, but hunger strike, we have to. We've nothing left except hunger strike. And I walked back. And it was, it was, it was a long walk from the visits back to the East Block. And I remember, I'll never forget the walk back, the prison officer beside me, uh, walking back with a long, long beard, long, long hair, dirty, filthy, and walking up the, the path. And walking up the path into the blocks, there's two wings, and every face was at the window looking to see if I had any skill, as we call skill, which is news, had any news for them. And I didn't know what I was going to tell these people. Uh, and we never ever spoke until after 8 o'clock when the screws locked up and there was only one or two screws left on the wing. And at the end of the cell that, that day, and Bobby Sands was in the next cell to me. And Bobby was obviously at the pipe right away. We used to we used to dig holes in the wall so that we could communicate. And I told Bobby, it's up in the air, and we have to organize a hunger strike. Bobby obviously was in total agreement with it. And from there, we started to organize the hunger strike. By that night, I got up to the door. It was half past eight at night when everything was quiet. None of, none of the rest of the prisoners knew, except myself and Bobby, that the whole process through Cardinal Fee had fallen through. And I announced to them, uh, what had happened, and that we have no alternative but to call a hunger strike. And I remember the total, utter silence. Uh, and that night, Bobby Bobby had a great voice for shouting. Bobby done most of the shouting, most of the communication in Irish at the window. And we began, the word got around that night through the communication through Bobby and the Irish language. And I, I mentioned earlier on that Long Cash was a quiet place. That was a really silent place that night. The next day, over the next couple of days, I got communications back in from the other blocks, volunteers. I asked for volunteers for a hunger strike. And I think it was 148 volunteers. I wanted six. We decided on six, one from each county. Uh, and I got 148 names in so over the next couple of days. Uh, myself and Bobby selected six people. Actually, Bobby wanted to go on the first hunger strike. And I decided the answer. that I felt the responsibility that I should do it. I called it. I should, I should be on it. And, well, the, the process started from there. Six of us went on hunger strike. Uh, so so you, you represented Antrim? 
And, and what were the qualifications and what was the tough decision to pick one from the other counties? How did they qualify? It, it, it was very, very hard. It was very, very hard to pick people. I mean, one, one person I had rejected uh, was a guy called Sean McKenna. And Sean begged me, begged me uh, to, to, to choose his name. And I honestly did. Uh, the other qualification was there was people from the Irish National Liberation Army there as well. And um, we allowed one one of theirs, one of one of, from that organisation, to go on the hunger strike. The biggest majority of the people in the long at that time were professional IRA people. Uh, there was a small group of INRA people, and they demanded that they have a representative on the hunger strike, and we agreed to that. Uh, and a guy called John Nixon, representing the NLA, joined the hunger strike with us. Uh, and what happened with that first hunger strike in 1980? Uh, the hunger strike went on for uh, 53 days. On the 41st day, we got representations from British civil servants who came in and produced this document as an attempt to solve the hunger strike. Uh, we went away. We, the, the, at this stage, the six of us were in the prison hospital, and we had met in what was called the canteen room, and we were allowed some time to discuss. Uh, we went, we went back and and into our cells, and ten days later, they came back again uh, with another document, which they produced, and which we studied, and which we believed was a possible. A, a possible solution to the, to the problem. Um, on the 53rd day, the day the hunger strike ended, uh, a priest who was representing us met a British civil servant at a Belfast airport. And the only way this priest could recognize this guy was he would have a red carnation in his, in his coat. He met, the priest met this, this, this civil servant, or this person, whoever he was with the red carnation, who passed over a document. That night, the night the hunger strike ended, Bobby Sanson, the priest, was in the prison hospital. To this stage, uh, Sean McKenna was in a coma uh, and was almost dead. The doctor, Dr. Ross, who was our doctor at the time, uh, told me that, that Sean had only a few hours to live. Uh, I believe that we had the basis of a solution. Uh, they were Sean out on a, on a stretcher. Uh, at that stage, I, was, I was still able to walk, and there was two priests there, Father Murphy and Father Toner, who helped me out to the hallway when they were rushing Sean up, and Dr. Ross begged me right, to save Sean's life. And I said, feed him.
believe that, and as he did so at times, it leading to the point where Bobby sent a communication to me that stopped allowing Bobby up to see me at this stage. Um, Bobby sent a communication to me that said he didn't see any alternative here except another hunger strike. Uh, I fought with Bobby actually over this. Uh, I didn't believe that we should go on a second hunger strike. Bobby was the OC, I was not. It's, it's effectively stood down when I went on hunger strike. And it was Bobby's decision that the second hunger strike should take place. Now, the significant part of this second hunger strike, which happened in 1981, was the election of Bobby Sands to the British Parliament for Fermanagh, South Tyrone. Maybe you can describe to our audience, what was that like? And was that a big gamble by putting him up? Because had he lost, it might have discredited the hunger strike. But what was it like in the prison? And how did you find out that he won the election? Well, I mean... We, we had, didn't have any form of communication. Any communication we had, we used to uh, smuggle it in, uh, and, and small pieces, small articles or whatever. We, we had no newspapers, we had no radio, we had no television. And when we heard right, that Bobby was elected, we were elated. I mean, the whole world knew uh, that period because we were totally isolated at that, at that time uh, and totally demoralized at that time when, when Bobby's election didn't make any difference and then when, when Bobby died and, and again the whole world knew before we knew uh, the priest came to my cell um, in the early hours of, of the morning after Bobby died and, and told me and I knew as soon as the priest walked into my cell that Bobby was dead and it, it was just an abyss to, to, to us And then, did you just have any ceremony inside the prison? Yeah, well, I mean, when you're locked in a cell, I mean, uh, all, all the into silence. Silence is, 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 a, is a thing that we know very, very well in the jail. And we had a two minute silence, right? Um, and that's, that's Sunday after Bobby's death. That's the only time we got out of ourselves, was we went to Mass. And. We had a special, a special mass within the, in the jail. Every every wing had a special mass in the jail for for that. But then, you know, the whole process started all over again, uh, ten times. And then it was called off in the the fall. And then I believe shortly afterwards, the demands were implemented by the Thatcher administration. The demands were implemented. Yeah, yeah. And the, the demands were implemented by the fact that. Uh, we went out. They, they allowed us our clothes in. They gave us our clothes after the death. Uh, and we went out, out of ourselves. And it was a, it's a totally different regime altogether. Here we were, we had shoes on, we had clothes on, we had dignity. Uh, and these same people who had tortured us all the all the years were still there. Uh, and we went into the, in, into the prison system. We went to the works. They, they forced us to go to work. So we went to work. And we sabotaged everything we could put our hands on. We broke all the machines. Uh, we've done everything uh, that we could do to disrupt the whole prison regime. To eventually, when it came to the point where they said Don't, they wouldn't let us go to work anymore. So we'd won that demand. Demand not to work, not to do prison work. And over over a period of a year, all the demands that we asked for, we, we had. We had our own clothes. We had our free association. We were uh, treated. Uh, as political prisoners. We had a representative of every ring who was no C, who the prison governor had to uh, recognize. And effectively, we won all the demands that we wanted. It, it came at a great cost. It came at too big a cost, I think. Yes. And, and, and did it mainly have to do with Thatcher's entrenchments throughout the whole negotiations of the hunger strike? Or, or, or entrenchments? Yeah. Yes. I think it was, it was largely to do with that. I think there, was, there were people there in Whitehall, in the British government, who w would have been quite prepared to give us what what, what we had. I mean, I, I mean, I spent uh, almost eight years in prison in my own clothes with political status. And here they were trying to take it, take it away from us. Uh, and eventually they had to concede that we were political prisoners. They could not control us. And if they tried to control us, uh, they, 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 they couldn't. We resisted every attempt right, to the point where 10 men died. Uh, and Thatcher, Thatcher, that woman, Thatcher, 
just could not accept the fact that we were political prisoners. We were fighting for a cause. Which brings us up to what's going on today, and I, I want to go back into the prison because there's been a lot of discussion that the, the, the process that was signed in 1998 had its germs in, within the prison, within the discussion groups with uh, Jerry Adams, Bobby Sands, and yourself about a, a way forward, a way out of what was going on. Yeah. How, how much of you guys were in that development of the thought process that brought us to the treaty that was signed in 1998? And was it ever even discussed in the prison that the way to a united Ireland was to bring back storm and, and, and some of the things that have come about out of the process? Absolutely not. Um, when a lot of us went in the prison. We were, I mean, some of them were in their teens, uh, 20, 21, uh, all, all young, young men. A lot of us went in with uh, not a great deal of political thought in our heads. Within Long Cash, within the cages of Long Cash, uh, we began to push. And I remember Jerry, was, Jerry was the, was the main driving force behind this, that we need politically educated rank and file, politically educated rank and file. And within Long Cash, we began to do that. We had debates, we had discussions, we had arguments. Uh, we read about the Palestinian cause, we read about the South African cause, we debated all these causes, and we became politically educated. We, be, we became uh, not just the, the soldier right, who was capable of firing a gun, but the person who was able to think uh, before he fired the gun. The whole development started there. Uh, I mean, I was in the cages with Bobby Sands, right, and I was in the hate smacks with Bobby Sands, and we went through this whole whole situation where we became, and we knew, that before we went into prison, there was Sinn Féin and there was the IRA, and all the fighting we were doing, we were creating a party uh, called uh, the SDLP, actually, right, who, who became the, 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 the nationalist voice of the IRA. Well, they, they were not representing the IRA, but the SDLP was largely created by the, 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 the war that was going on. And we knew if, they're going to fight a, if you're going to fight a war, then you've got to fight a war and be able to talk after the fighting stops. So the whole uh, sort of people who are involved in the, in the struggle now are, are politically educated ex-soldiers. Uh, All right. Now, you were released, I think, in 1986. And in the interview you did with the magazine that uh, we will be giving out the web uh, address later on, you stated that you went to work for contractors in West Belfast mm -hmm. and how... Uh, you were reminiscing about what your father said when he was released, that nothing much had changed after all the suffering that went on and everything that was going on, that you were still being exploited by what you were calling cowboy contractors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I remember the stories my father used to tell me, but when, when they all got out of jail, people like Billy McKee, my father, Punches McCart, and so forth, uh, they were sort of alienated from society, and they couldn't get work anywhere. So they had to go and take any sort of work they could get. Uh, I remember feeling that that's been so sad. There was people who went went to war to try and bring about a democratic socialist republic, and they're they're, they're working for these people and who are being exploited. Uh, when I got out of prison in 1986, I found myself right back in the same position again as my father did, and I couldn't get work anywhere. I couldn't leave West Belfast. I was too well known. I couldn't get work outside of West Belfast. I had to stay here, but the only work I could get would be on a building site. And these people, uh, they, were, they were Catholic, they were called themselves nationalists, uh, but they were doing exactly the same. They were paying people 16 to 15 pounds per day, uh, where the, the average would be 30, 35 pounds per day. Um, that still persists today. And it's not just builders, right? there's loads of employers who do the same. And me being a Republican and me being involved in the Republican struggle, one of my objectives in fighting this war and trying to bring about uh, a democratic socialist republic is to fight for the working class. And unfortunately, today, I don't see that happening. I see the working class being exploited again and being allowed, the Republican movement allowing people to exploit the ordinary working man and woman. Uh, and I'm totally opposed to that. And one 
a few years ago, I, I, I wrote an article for uh, a full black Republican news against these people. And I found I, I had to fight with, with, with the editorial uh, people within on full black uh, to, pu- to publish the, the thing. And when it eventually was published, it was totally censored. Uh, I wanted to expose these people years and years ago. And and I wasn't allowed to. The article was printed okay, but there was no follow-up to it. There was no editorial, there was no campaign, there wasn't anything. And over this last few years, I, I've kept quiet. I haven't said anything through a sense of loyalty to the Republican movement. And don't get me wrong, I, am, I still feel and am a member of the Republican movement. I still believe in the Republican cause. I don't believe there's anybody outside the Republican movement that can bring about any changes. The problem I find is that uh, Republicans are sitting back and there's some of them there who have made careers out of politics and have left the whole principle that 10 men died for and hundreds of men died for and hundreds of men and women went to jail for. They've left the pain. Right? And I think they need to be wakened up and it needs to be pointed out to them. Uh, and as I said in the article, it, it took a great deal of time for me to come to the point where I could put pen to paper and write this. And I do it reluctantly, but I do it through necessity and I do it through uh, to my comrades who've died. But, Brendan, you do pay a price. Here on Radio Free Aaron, we've had people on like Marion Price who have spoken out against this agreement, and then they're ostracized in uh, Republican clubs where she's not allowed into some. Some of the songs that were written about her in the 70s are not allowed to be sung in the clubs. I mean, you're talking about loyalty, but it's also a great risk within the community that you're born and raised that you're going to be ostracized for those views. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that, that's, that's a risk we have to take. I mean, Marion and, and Dolores would be would be comrades of mine, uh, and some of the people who would ostracise people like that or ostracise people like me, uh, I have no time for. Let them their patty little minds ostracise, right? But anyone who, who would want to ostracise me, I would want to ask them the question: Do you agree? with everything the public movement's doing. If they do, then okay. Then go away from me. I have no time for you. If they don't agree and they don't say anything, then I think they're a moral card. At least Marion has uh, the guts to stand up and say something uh, that she believes it's wrong. I don't necessarily agree with everything that Marion says, but I absolutely agree with the right for her to say or anyone else to say what they, what they believe in. But, Brendan, one of the problems about this whole process that started with Jerry Adams and John Humes, and it's been bantered around in the press, it's called a pan-nationalist front. Mm -hmm. Never at no time did they say it's a pan-Republican front. So it's quite obvious that Republicans had to go over to a nationalist point of view in order to join that front. Because I can tell you from here in America, there's always been a pan-nationalist front with the Irish government, with Ted Kennedy, with the American government, and with John Hume. Uh, Always stopping people people from getting visas to come into this country. So what an actual fact happened is a certain part of the Republican movement has joined that nationalist, nan- uh, nationalist front. Yes, and, I, and uh, I'm not part of it. Uh, and that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I think they need to be pulled back from that. I think we need to get back to the principles of Republicanism, the principles that I was brought up with, uh, the principles of James Conley, of Liam Mallows, uh, of, of true Republicanism. And I see, I see the people, some of these people going about now, and they could just be happy to be members of the SDLP. Uh, and the SDLP is not a party that I would be involved in. Uh, Sinn Féin, some of the Sinn Féin leadership at the minute, I didn't want to be involved in them. I want the Republican movement back to its roots. But what, what they'll tell you is then the doors will shut, the visas will stop, we'll not get into the White House on St. Patrick's Day, the fundraising will stop in America, and we'll be an isolated party. Whereby if we have all these doors open, maybe we can make some progress, but there is a price to open those doors. Well, I mean, if you have all the doors open, and you walk through the doors and leave your children behind, what the hell uses the door open if you're leaving the children behind? I mean, we're talking about a Republican family here, a family that's been, that's been fighting the war for so many years. Uh, I think if, if, if you're honest, sincere, and stick by the ideals that you fought for, and so what? If the doors closed, then kick them down some way. 
I mean, the store used doors opening. I've actually leaving everything behind you. And I'm afraid that, that there's some people within the leadership that are prepared to do that. But I, mean, I, 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 I talk to people every day on the ground, and most of them, ex-prisoners, all Republicans, uh, who are very unhappy with the way things are going. But I, mean, I, I know the point you're making. I mean, you have to get some doors open somewhere, but I don't think you should leave your principles behind to do that. You're listening to Radio Free Aaron, and this will be aired on St. Patrick's Day. We're speaking with Brendan Hughes, who is the former OC of the H Blocks and in Long Kesh. We started off the beginning of the show with his background uh, about being in prison, and now we're going up into what was signed in 1998. Now, Brendan, in your wildest dreams when you were fighting to bring down the, the local government in the six counties called Stormont, mm -hmm. that you would see a day where you actually have... Sinn Féin begging the loyalists to go into Stormont and actually having administering British rule in Ireland and being paid by the British uh, government to do it. Now, in your article, you stated you wanted to, uh, you think there is an insurgency program going on by the British government to mold a Republican leadership that they can deal with. Maybe you can explain how this came about that we, we now have members of Sinn Féin fighting to get into a, a British government in the six counties. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something I, I, I could never visualize in my wildest dreams. I, I, I never visualized that whatsoever. Uh, the, the problem is, in 1972, there was a ceasefire, an IRA ceasefire, and the British, British government tried to get people involved in this long, drawn-out ceasefire just to end the war. And it was recognized within, within a, a period of two weeks. It was recognized, and the war was back on again. In 1975... Uh, they released certain people. They arrested certain people and released certain people. Jerry Adams was one of the people arrested. I was one of the, one of the people that people arrested. They released other people from the prison who became the leadership of the Republican movement. And within the prison, people like myself and Jerry uh, opposed the ceasefire. And, and some of the articles that, that, that Jerry wrote in the Brownie articles was warning the leadership, you're getting drawn into a long drawn out ceasefire. The British are trying to stop the war. Uh, and they're trying to mold us into the type of people that they can deal with. And they, as I say, they selectively released people from prison, uh, knowing they would be in the leadership. And knowing their profiles and knowing the backgrounds and knowing that the, the British could deal with them. Uh, in the 90s, I think they have done the same. They have done the same. They've, all, they've allowed a leadership to develop. They have, they have pumped millions in, in here. Uh, I mean, there's, there's centers all over the place in, in West Belfast, North Belfast. People have, have, have got into these centers They've and become career people. And, they're, and they've been paid very decent wages, certainly a lot more than the, 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 than the, the people in the building sites have been paid. Uh, and the British have encouraged this. Uh, and alienated other people to the point where you have people breaking away, forming the, the continuity IRA, the real IRA, uh, which, which I, I am not a supporter of. Um, I, I, I think the leadership needs to look at itself and needs to find out, are they playing the British game here? And I believe they are. I mean, can, can end the Stormont, uh, the contradiction of a Republican begging loyalists to come in the Stormont, uh, it, it's just so hard for me to swallow. Uh, uh, also, we had Martin McGuinness in, in this country stating that uh, when these votes were taken, that he was voted in by the Irish people, and he was voted by the Irish people to administer uh, British rule in Ireland. But then the rug was pulled out from under him when uh, they just passed a law in London negating any vote that took place in Ireland and just stated, uh, unless you play the game, you know, we can give you your uh, to be a minister and we can also take that away. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, it, 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 that's, I think the whole thing has been built in sand. And, I, and I, 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 it never ceases to amaze me how, how, how we, we've allowed ourselves to get into this position where, I mean, Britain controls everything here. They still control everything. The RUC is still here. The whole structure is still here. The judiciary is still here. Uh, the murder machine is still here. And I mean, I mean, hospitals are getting closed down. Uh, schools, schools are, are getting uh, undercut. And we find ourselves in a position as Republicans administrating this. Uh, and, and we don't have any control. I mean, how far, how far down the line do we go here? 
do we do we start putting on wigs and and and, and join the, the judiciary, the British judiciary? Do we start administrating uh, British justice in Ireland? We we're, we're at, the, at at the moment or, or when the assembly was going, we were administrating British rule. Uh, how far how far do we go here? Uh, and t- t- to me, the whole thing can, can can turn into be a complete farce. But, but where the hell is republicanism gone? And what I, all I'm trying to do is, I don't have an alternative. People keep saying to me, uh, if you're going to criticize, put up an alternative. I don't have an alternative. The alternative is within the Republican movement. I think there has to be open, honest debate. I mean, I, do you, you heard about the, the Hume Adams document. What is it? Have you seen it? No. No, I haven't seen it. I don't know what it's about. What was said in the Hume Adams document that brought this whole process about? I don't know. And the, the reason why people like me uh, and Anthony McIntyre and the rest of the people that I'm involved with, with, with the Raiders group, are, we want to know what, what's going on. And we, we don't know what's going on. We can see what's going on. Uh, but what, what's the purpose of it all? But a lot of it, Brendan, and you can see a lot of people are just walking away from the movement saying, listen, I've given so much of my life, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to take some of the benefits that are coming in. So many economic benefits are coming in. And and people are getting disillusioned. I mean, how are Republicans to overcome that when there, there are job opportunities opening up? And if you take the road you're taking, uh, those job opportunities are going to get very small. We're, 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 I'm not talking about job opportunities here. There are, there are people in jobs, okay. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not in a job. Uh, thousands of people aren't in the job. There was 1,800 people lost their jobs this morning because they just closed down the shipyard. Uh, I mean, what, what, what are we talking about? I'm talking about a Republican cause here. I'm talking about justice. I'm talking about working, working people's right for a job. I'm, I'm not talking about a handful of selected people walking into well-paid jobs and having good salaries. And even even at, at that, with all these people I'm talking about who's in well-paid jobs, it can stop tomorrow if the British decide to stop it, if they decide to pull the plug. These well-paid jobs and these people who are in jobs have no control over their own lives. I mean, there's, there's 1,800 men walked out of the shipyard today with no work left. We have no control over that. So when we're talking about jobs here, I mean, you can have a job but have no security. I want a job and I want security of job. And I want a job for my son, my daughter. I want security. I want to have control over that. A job's a job, but security is, is the most important thing. Well, Brendan, uh, we've been almost speaking an hour, and I'm, I'm very grateful for putting on the record uh, some of the historical background about how we got to the point where we've gotten to. Uh, what do you re- recommend we do, particularly here in America? We have a lot of Republican people living in the tri-state area, and uh, people will be listening on the Internet who were forced to come to this country because of some of the things that are going on. I think they should look, they should look at the situation, look at the background, look at the history. Of, of what Ireland has done to itself. Uh, look at what happened to the, the people you're talking about who are living in America now who had to leave Ireland. I don't want to have to leave Ireland. I don't want my children to have to leave Ireland. What I think we should do is talk, debate. If you think there's something wrong, say it. It may hurt some people, but if you believe uh, you're right. I think you should speak up. I think people should have a great look and, and not be carried away with uh, the, the, the mass media stuff. Right? Look, look at look at the end of the belly of the beast and see what's really happening. And I, I mean, I know so many people here in Belfast and, and throughout throughout Ireland who are disillusioned and who are walking away and who just don't see any hope. But what I would hope to be able to do would be to give them a view where they can feel able to contribute to the debate. And I think that the debate is the most important thing, and it's our way out of this. Uh, and look back into Republicans. What is Republicanism all about? That's all I would ask them to do. Yeah, Brendan, in this country, too, with people in Irish Northern Aid and the Clan of Gale always being marginalized, there is this looking up. They say, look, we're in the White House. There's a picture of Jerry oh, Adams yeah. meeting with Clinton. And I, and I would have to believe a lot of people on the Falls Road would say, look how far we've come. Look at the pictures. We're on the front page of the New York Times. There's been, uh, say, clubs or businesses that you couldn't get involved with are now uh, allowing in people with Republican backgrounds to get involved with. And, and people are looking at this as uh, a way forward that, that this is a great thing that's happened yeah i would i would say i have a house and i p 
paint the whole outside of it beautiful. And inside the house, there's no furniture. What the hell uses the house? 